Aloha. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here today to talk about questions about human rights in the United States under a Trump presidency. And joining me today is Professor Aaron Felmuth from Arizona State University. He is a professor of law and Willard H. Pedrick, Distinguished Research Scholar at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law. So, aloha, Aaron. Thank you for joining me today. Aloha, it's a pleasure to be here. Great, thank you so much. Um, so you, you are a, a professor of law over at Sandra Day O'Connor's College of Law. Um, can you tell us a bit about your area of professional special, specialization? Well, I'm, a, I'm an international lawyer, and so what I do involves uh, human rights as well as more generally the way the states relate to one another. Human rights is a bit of an exception though because that's a matter that has individual benefits for, for people like you and me and is not just about states committing to one another but committing to one another for the specific purpose of uh, protecting the interests of individuals. Yes, and you're also the chair of the International Human Rights Law Section uh, of the American branch of the International Law Association, correct? That's right. The International Law Association is a group of lawyers, academics, and diplomats who uh, uh, have banded together to uh, promote international law and its understanding. And the American branch is, of course, the United States branch of it. And, and my committee is the International Human Rights Committee, right? And recently, your committee has set up a subcommittee on the U.S. compliance uh, on international human rights law. Um, what inspired that to, to be formed in, in recent months? Well, it, it's always been important to ensure the United States compliance with international human rights law. Uh, it's become more important recently because for the first time uh, in the last hundred years, we have uh, a president-elect who's vowed to do some things that very clearly violate human rights law. And so I created the subcommittee in order to monitor the administration and, and to ensure that it doesn't, uh, well, basically do any of the things that it promised to do. Uh, the, committee, the subcommittee is composed of uh, 16 lawyers from around the world, mostly in the United States, but, but all over as well as uh, 14 law students, about half of whom are from ASU, the rest from elsewhere. And uh, this is a nonpartisan group. We're not ideologically motivated. We're not uh, affiliated with any political party. The goal is just to ensure that we maintain the highest standards of commitment to human rights and uh, have a rapid reaction force ready in case something disastrous happens. Yes, uh, uh, international human rights is, is not ideologically oriented and, and probably no state in the world has a perfect human rights record. So, I mean, certainly there, there are reports and criticisms of, of Amer other American administrations um, not having perfect human rights record. Um, what raises particular concerns about uh, the human rights observance by the United States under a, a Trump presidency? Well, that, that's right. I mean, there is no history of, of perfect compliance in any administration, uh, but uh, Trump has been very explicit. He said a number of things that would be uh, serious human rights violations that he proposed to do if elected. And then what's more troubling still, some of these are actual crimes against humanity or war crimes. And so they're, they're very serious uh, indeed. Yes, okay. Aaron, um, we're gonna take a short break right here just to uh, deal with a couple of technical issues, so we'll be right back on Global Connections. Stay tuned. This is Steve Katz. I'm a marriage and family therapist, and I do shrink wrap, which is now going to every other week, all during the summer and maybe forever after. Take care of your mental health this summer. Have a good time. Do what's fun and take good care of yourself. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Uh, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here with Aaron Felmuth of Arizona State University, and we're talking about questions about U.S. Uh, observance of our human rights violations uh, under a Trump presidency. Welcome back, Aaron. Thank you. 
Yeah, so we were talking about, um, yes, like records of, of presidents historically, you know, we, we, there are always human rights watchdogs to, to ensure that presidents or other, other members of government know when they're not fully living up to their obligations to international human rights laws. Um, some of the things that uh, President-elect Trump has said, however, raise particular concerns because of, you know, the, the nature of the statements um, kind of reflecting maybe not consideration of even how they, you know, wh whether human rights play into uh, his way of thinking. That's right. I, I think he's not very well informed in this subject. And the hope is that a lot of what he said during his campaign is just bluster or said to achieve popularity with a certain segment of the population and that he doesn't really intend to go through with it. On the other hand, um, some of the things he said raises concerns about his moral commitment to the values that underlie human rights, like human dignity and equal respect for human dignity. And uh, so those raise special concerns. If you'd like, I can, I can discuss some of the things that he said that have been particularly troublesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that would be really, really helpful. Well, uh, on November 20th, 2015, last year, for example, he said in an interview with an MSNBC reporter that he would certainly implement a database of all Muslims in the United States. And then the following day at a rally in Birmingham, Alabama, he said he would uh, use the database to monitor the activities of Muslims and mosques in the United States. Now, to be fair, most of his statements focus on Muslim immigrants and refugees, but he's never uh, rejected the idea of a universal registry of all Muslims. That would create a number of problems under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the United States uh, was a party to. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And there are general principles of non-discrimination involved. And of course, creating a, a registry of that kind, putting aside the, you know, the allusions to history that it creates and very disturbing history um, would almost certainly violate uh, those principles. Those principles are also found in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a very widely adhered to human rights treaty to which the United States is a party and has been a party for a long time. Uh, so non-discrimination, equality before the law, those would be a problem. There's also an, an additional uh, provision that most people aren't aware of because it's not really reflected in our Constitution so much like equality is. Uh, but under Article 27 of the International Covenant, in those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in community with other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, and so forth. And so, again, any attempt to stigmatize or uh, uh, you know, isolate or otherwise uh, put Muslims at a disadvantage uh, would put us in violation of our human rights obligations. Mm -hmm. yes, and, and during his campaign, some of the um, things that he said were, which were a bit uh, unusual for a, a public figure running for political office, um, statements about, about women, um, as well as other, other minority groups, uh, do those, even though he doesn't necessarily come out with any particular policy position, do those uh, raise any questions or concerns? Yes, and no, that's a little more complex because although there are international human rights instruments that uh, forbid even uh, forms of speech that are hateful to specific groups based on ethnicity, religion, and so forth, um, and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women would uh, require some kind of of measure to prevent or punish attempts to discriminate against women in public uh, fora. We're not really, um, first of all, we're not parties to that convention. And second, um, we have exceptions or what we call reservations that we've made mm -hmm. to the conventions relating to, to regulation of speech. And so it's disturbing, it's um, morally repugnant, but is it illegal under international law? Probably not. Mm -hmm. There are other things that he's uh, proposed to do, though, that are clearly illegal. For example, uh, in December 2015, he said in a campaign press release that he would, uh, he actually read this out loud at a rally in South Carolina. He said he would impose a total and complete shutdown on Muslims entering the country. Again, mm -hmm. 
the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights forbid discrimination based on religion. And so that would certainly violate those rights. And there are other things, I mean, worse things that he said. Obviously, he said, you may recall this, I'm sure everyone does, that in February of this year, uh, during the Republican debates, he said he'd bring back waterboarding of accused terrorists and do a hell of a lot worse. That were his words than that. And he said it again um, at a campaign event uh, about a week and a half later, he would torture accused terrorists. And then he said uh, on Fox and Friends that he would assassinate the families of accused mm -hmm. terrorists. Again, putting aside the uh, loathsome morals of someone who would make a statement like that, uh, human rights problems are, are just legion with something like that. Uh, it would violate the rights to life, liberty, and security of person mm -hmm. in those two instruments I just mentioned before, the right to recognition of a person anywhere, and also, and this is where I mentioned the thing about war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, the Geneva Conventions of 1949 uh, in uh, uh, which we're parties to and have long been parties to, prohibit murder of civilians, they prohibit mm -hmm. punishing civilians for the offenses that they haven't personally committed. Mm -hmm. They're very specific about that. Uh, they forbid, of course, uh, any uh, any kind of of uh, harm to children, um, and more generally, they prohibit attacks on civilians. And that's also made its way into the International Criminal Court statute. Again, we're not parties to the International Criminal Court statute, mm -hmm. however. Acts that the United States commits in countries that are parties to the ICC statute could give rise to prosecution mm -hmm. of the responsible individuals before the International Criminal Court. And we're actually under investigation for, for the tortures we committed in Afghanistan. Right now, we're, we're, being, we're being investigated. Yes, yes, I heard that the uh, ICC prosecutor had brought that up in the discussion um, for, yeah, for uh, international human rights law it's the enforcement mechanisms are differ, differ, right, according to what type of violations, what kind of deprivations. Um, one is, you know, in the case of, of war crimes or other types of international crimes, the, the International Criminal Court could be the venue for that. Um, but in other ways, sort of what you are trying to uh, pursue here with uh, establishing the subcommittee is to, you know, make public and put pressure on governments, and that's, that's another way uh, to ensure compliance. So can you tell us a little bit more about the composition and, and the work that the subcommittee will be doing? Well, the first thing we'll be doing is monitoring, keeping a very close eye on everything the administration does. And human rights is a, is a very broad area of law. There are a lot of human rights that are set forth in various instruments and that we have. Um, and these include political rights, they include economic rights, social rights, cultural rights. The ones we have in the United States tend to focus more on political rights, but we're going to be monitoring them all. So whether it's the right to education, whether it's the right to freedom of the press, freedom of speech, the right against torture, uh, a human right established in many instruments, including a specific UN Convention Against Torture. Uh, and by the way, that also extends, I just wanted to point this out, that also extends to uh, any inhuman or uh, degrading treatment, mm -hmm. uh, outrages upon personal dignity, these kinds of things can be war crimes as well as uh, crimes against humanity. And although torture is, is by far the worst, um, other forms of inhuman degrading treat treatment are also forbidden by international human rights law, and specifically the Convention Against Torture, to which we are a party. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll be monitoring this and, and all the other uh, uh, human rights subjects and making sure that the administration complies. And if it doesn't, uh, we basically are going to have a rapid reaction force of lawyers who will uh, do a number of things. One is uh, ensure that uh, the public is made aware uh, of the relevance of what the administration is proposing to do or we're doing to our obligations under international human rights law. We'll be um, taking action through the courts, through international agencies like the UN Human Rights Committee or uh, the uh, Inter-American Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. um, and we'll be uh, uh, putting pressure on the administration through Congress. Um, Again, this human rights, as you pointed out, uh, Dr. Chang, is a, is a nonpartisan issue. And most members of Congress care a lot about the U.S. record of compliance with international human rights law. And so we will be able to act through Congress to ensure oversight and to ensure that any violation of human rights law results in swift and uh, effective action, including uh, impeachment and conviction if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I mean, uh, maintaining a, a, a good record in terms of, of uh, observing human rights law is very critical for a country that, that purports and would like to remain a leader in the world. Um, some of the persons being considered by President-elect Trump for his foreign policy positions have also kind of voiced, I think, uh, some, some words that, that might raise concerns about, about human rights. So, so you're dealing with both domestic issues uh, as far as, for example, repealing or, or overturning the Affordable Care Act um, to what his, his foreign uh, policy team might, might be thinking as far as uh, U.S. performance on, on, that, on that arena. That's right. And I mean, it's, it's very broad. I mean, human rights is a broad area, and President-elect Trump has threatened to violate many different kinds of human rights. The human right to education, he, he has never you know, said that he would deny people education, but it's a very important right, and he's, his, uh, his nomination right now uh, is someone who may not fully implement the right to education in a nonpartisan way and with respect to all uh, faiths and denominations. And that's, it's very important that uh, people not be, for example, um, coerced into uh, Christian education if they're not Christian and don't want one, uh, so forth. And so that's, that's been a concern. And uh, there's been a number of others. Um, most recently, I mean, you probably heard in the news that he, he tweeted that um, nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag, they should be denied citizenship or sent to a year in jail. I mean, they just, they just keep coming out more and more. Mm -hmm. One of these things, that would violate, not, you know, not only the, the human rights to freedom of opinion and expression, uh, which includes expression through acts, um, however deplorable you may find those acts, um, they're protected speech, uh, and for a very good reason. But also, um, there are human rights uh, commitments for example, not to deprive someone of his nationality. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides in Article 15, no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality. And in the United States jurisprudence, the Supreme Court has said that the government may not use deprivation of nationality as a weapon to express its displeasure at a citizen's mm -hmm. conduct, as Tropi Dulles, 1958. So there's lots of uh, potential violations that you keep coming out with. And some of them, like you said, are, are more implicit. It depends on who he he nominate. For example, if you nominate someone for the Environmental Protection Agency whose goal is to tear down the organization, there's a human right to a safe and healthy environment. Human beings can't survive without it. And uh, if, the, if no one's protecting that environment, uh, then we've got a problem. We've got a human rights problem, and that's got to be rectified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly there are many uh, human rights deprivations that could be suffered if we do not protect the environment, such as for health, clean water, um, many other issues associated with that. So, yeah, so all eyes have been looking at those he's been considering for these high offices. Um, for one of the uh, persons candidate for a Secretary of State nomination also seemed to kind of veer away from maybe being taking a critical stance on, on some of the human rights records of, of other countries that we're dealing with. Kind of, it seems that there's a little bit of a discrepancy between how the U.S has been um, regarding human rights records, for example, in Russia and what this uh, representative has, has made statement of. Do you think the Trump administration, or do you think President-elect Trump, um, we were saying perhaps he's not as well informed about uh, international affairs because he did reach out personally to the leader, the president of the Republic of China, for example, and it seems that he doesn't really you know, appreciate kind of the, the kind of di diplomatic faux pas that that represents. Um, but uh, do you think that this is sort of just a lack of, of maybe appreciation for how, how we have been, you know, uh, taking in and internalizing human rights in, in the United States in our policymaking? Or do you think it's, it's willful uh, in disinterest in, in human rights as we have been trying to observe and, and protect? Uh, I can't read his mind. I I, I know that this is not, I mean, you know, he's got no experience in this area. It's not one of his core interests. His life has been spent trying to make money and, and make himself well known. That's what his core interests are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if you want to, you know, educate yourself about human rights, you've got to be interested in things like, you know, being a good person and, and what, you know, international law requires of us and, and being a leader in the international community. And that's something that, Almost every political candidate we've had uh, for the presidential office has 
you know, had very core to their interest. And whether they have always been proponents of human rights, maybe not, but uh, mm -hmm. certainly they've never, you know, made statements that are hostile to the very idea of human rights. Mm -hmm. And as you said, I mean, some of the, some of the things that he said um, may not themselves violate or propose a violation of human rights, but they do indicate, a, 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 you know, a, a very fundamental mentality of disrespect for equal human dignity. And you, you can't, you can't say something like, uh, you know, uh, illegal immigrants from Mexico are, are rapists and, and killers and bad hombres and, and not vilify an entire class of people, you know, mm -hmm. some people are, are, are very decent and, and law-abiding people otherwise. Um, and uh, and it, it's just a bad sign. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. The, uh, a president-elect who hasn't had any experience in public office, we'll see how, how well-educated he can get in this and other fields. So we'll take a, a short break here for a minute, and you're watching Global Connections here with Grace Chang, and I'm joined by Aaron Thelmuth of Arizona State University, Professor of Law. Thank Tech Hawaii, Asia in Review. I am Johnson Choi, the host. Looking forward to see you next month, December 15, Thursday, 11, right here at this channel. Aloha. Okay, we want to tell you about Hawaii, the state of clean energy, which plays every Wednesday from 4 to 4.30. Ray Starling and me, we co-host that show. Dean Nishina is here. He's from the Consumer Advocate. We just had a show. We liked the show. We had a good time on the show. What do you think, Ray? We're going to have Dean back because there's so much going on at the Consumer Advocate's office. And there's so much yet to be done to get to our 100% renewable energy goals. What do you think, Dean? Did you have a good time? I did have a good time. And I think this is a good opportunity for consumers to learn more because it, it'll be really helpful in terms of moving forward with our transition to clean energy. From your lips to God's ears. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Dean. Watch us, 4, 4 o'clock every Wednesday. You'll see. Aloha. Welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here with our Aaron Felmuth. Professor of Law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. And we're talking about questions about human rights uh, under a, a Trump presidency and, and prospects of, of how that might be observed or, or otherwise. So welcome back, Aaron. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Yeah, we were talking earlier about this question about, um, yeah, as far as being educated in, in how, well, what kind of obligations a state has when they are, are party to these kind of international law instruments. Um, and as far as, you know, reviewing some of, of President-elect Trump's statements, um, kind of a sh shows that he personally maybe hasn't himself internalized this and uh, as reflected in his own rhetoric. Um, what are some of your particular concerns for your beyond what, what we might be hearing? Well, I, I think this goes back to, you know, a, a lot of our presidents and presidential candidates have been lawyers. And, you know, we in the United States like to make a lot of jokes about lawyers because, you know, it's, it's tradition. Mm -hmm. and, but the fact is that someone who studied the law has spent a lot of time thinking about the rule of law and, you know, public order and how we structure things like solutions to social problems and things like justice and ethics. Mm -hmm. People, you know, frequently go into law being concerned with things like justice and ethics. And recently we've had a lot of businessmen running for, for, uh, for office, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily put a lot of thought into that. And so it, it could just be that that's his orientation, that he's just not thinking in those terms. So he'll, he'll say stuff, and he's a very off-the-cuff type of guy, um, from what I, you know, can pick up from, I don't know him personally, but from what I've seen, he's a very off-the-cuff type of guy, and he'll say things that are just, you know, Oh, what like a you know a high school student might say, uh, without thinking about it, without knowing any better, and like you said, it's possible that he'll you know get educated. But in the meantime, he's saying a lot of things like, you know, like his, like his tweets. He doesn't really put a lot of thought into these, and he hasn't really got any background. But he'll you know, for example, Sean Hannity asks him, you know, uh, basically, do you oppose the rights of of homosexuals to marry? And he says, I'm a traditional family type of guy. And he's probably completely unaware that the Supreme Court has recently uh, mm -hmm. uh, recognized the, the rights of, of same-sex couples to get married on, on equal terms. And again, back to human rights law, this is, this is part of a, a very large trend in the international community to recognize that you know, the rights to found a family uh, shouldn't depend on uh, the sex of the person you love. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
uh, that's just a, a huge, you know, uh, if, if you're if you're in law, you're very probably aware of it. But I don't think he is, and and maybe he'll change his mind once he he starts to realize that he's on the wrong side of history. But maybe he won't. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, coming from a totally different industry, right? From many of our our uh, tr uh, po politicians generally have have been coming from law, but but Donald Trump from business. So as far as yeah, his. Um, you know his statements. Hopefully, he's he's you know he seems to be riding this sort of populist wave, populist wave, and and but we know human rights really need to stand above the politics as we were talking about. Um, would you have uh, some closing statement you would like to make about about what uh, your subcommittee has been doing and and some of the things that you think are important for the audience to take away? Well, I think all Americans have to recognize that in order to to have a country we can be proud of, we have to have leadership we can be proud of. And a leader that we can be proud of is someone who is a good person, who's someone who pays close attention to the consequences of his conduct for other people. Because being a good person ultimately means self-sacrifice, putting other people's interests ahead of your own when they're more important than yours. And that's exactly what we should expect of a president. It's what we should expect of any politician, honestly, but foremost, the one who stands out as a figurehead and is the most publicly visible. We should expect especially that person to think in terms of what's good for everyone and not just what's good for him. And so we need to keep a very close eye on what he's doing and make sure that those tendencies of his, which are very strongly rooted in his character, don't dominate his administration. And if they do, to shut them down, to take action, to protest, to you know bring court cases. And that's what the subcommittee is here for. It's to, it's to help. But the public has got to be aware of this thing uh, these things too and it's got to uh you know basically act according to its conscience mm -hmm. including of course supporting politicians who oppose these measures very good thank you for discussing that initiative that you've undertaken in the uh, international law association and so we will all hopefully be taking keeping an eye out and, and speaking out in, in terms of the values of, of human rights that, that we want to uphold in the united states thank you so much for joining me today aaron Thank you for having me, Dr. Chen. All right, no worries. Okay, well, thank you all for tuning in today on Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang. You can catch me here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Aloha. Oh, I didn't know I was...